James chapter 1, and it's verses 13 and 14, but you can't just take lumps out like that. It sits in the context, doesn't it? So we refer to the rest of the chapter, no doubt. Okay, James is writing to Hebrew Christians, pretty much. So people with a Jewish background undergoing displacement and hardship. So within the Roman Empire, they're internally displaced persons. You see IDPs on the telly. We know about IDPs these days. Uh, people are sort of moved out of parts of Somalia or out of Sudan or wherever it happens to be. Uh, and and this, is what, this is what he's dealing with. He's writing to people like that. He's writing to people who are refugees in a wider world. Jewish people scattered and displaced. Chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. It's almost certain the first readers are Jewish. It's almost certain that they are disadvantaged in this worldly terms. Chapter 5 talks about them being taken advantage of by wealthy landlords. Chapter 2 talks about them being hauled into court by rich people who scorn their Christian faith and so on and so on. Jewish, disadvantaged, most under threat from pressure to conform conform to the world around them and its ways and its values and, and everything else. Chapter 4, verse 4, emphasises that friendship with the world is <coughs> enmity against God because the pressure's on to compromise with uh, the world's way of doing things. But worse than that, they are subjected to hardship and that hardship is in danger of dividing them from Christ. Why is that a danger? It's because he is about the only one they've got going for them. He's about all they've got. That would be a danger. He is their strength. He is their source of everything good, particularly in their difficult circumstance. But what's happening is the pressure's coming on, and as we said last week, I think, when the pressure comes on, you make a decision. Every human being is in that situation. The pressure comes on, and it either drives you closer to God, or it drives you away from him. And you see people in situations of stress and conflict and pressure and difficulty. And this is what takes place. Those hardships will either drive you to the God who is the source of your help in those, or drive you away from him in bitterness and anger and despair. Shaking your fist at heaven. Hardship has those two outcomes. It drives you nearer to God or further from Him. It's as it were the litmus paper test of what is in our hearts towards God. Very often. So these people are scattered. Probably it's Acts 11 that provides the background to this. You know, the church was scattered. Persecution broke out after Stephen. The church was scattered. And some people went down to Antioch and preached Christ there. And a church started. And that church became the centre of the Gentile mission. Do you remember that? In Acts 11? Somebody nod, I'll feel better. <laughs> Don't mind. Um, but um, that's probably the background to it. James was martyred about 62 AD, so it's before the big imperial persecution of Christians that this seems to be written. But there'd been trouble up at Jerusalem before James died. It looks like that's the background to James's letter. So how were these fairly new Christians? They've got every reason to expect things to be great now they're Christians. Is that the way people think? Oh, yeah, Christian, fantastic, everything's going to be great. How are they to consider the hardship that following Jesus brought them? Now, I've observed this for many years, and I, I, you know, it's, it's nothing new. Um, the important thing when hardship comes on, is that suffering comes to a person, is the way the individual thinks about it. And the way they relate to it. They used to teach us, you know, uh, if you think you can, you can, right? Now, there's, there are limits to that. There are definite limits to that, okay? But the important thing when it comes to suffering for a Christian is the way that the individual thinks about it, how you consider what is happening to you. And some Christian people you see going through, forgive me, it sometimes seems very little, right? But it's devastating to them. And then you see people going through, what is happening to these people? You know, how are they dealing with that? And they think very little of it. It doesn't phase them at all. I've just been reading the book, I'll tell you. I got it free on Kindle, which is a marvellous thing to do. Getting books for free on Kindle. As long as they're good books, of course. You can be tosh. Uh, but this is a good book. And it's written by a guy who was, for most of his missionary life in Korea, a missionary to Somalia. 
Now this is all through the breakdown of civil government in Somalia, all through you know Al Shabaab and the emergence of these sort of pirate groups and all the rest of it, and the extremist Islamists and so on. And he was a missionary there. People were he, he was going in there doing a lot of aid work and so on and so on, sharing his faith as he could. And people became Christians, and of course, as soon as it's discovered they become a Christian, they slice off the heads of the people who become Christians. That's a bit of a tough call. And so he came out of there, and he was trying to get his head back together working at a Bible college in America so just as a job to get himself he's been through an awful lot of stuff and somebody gave him a scholarship to go around and study how it is that uh, churches under persecution around the world deal with the suffering that they encounter a number of really very interesting things coming out of that study trip he was doing uh, people coming out of Russia coming out of Ukraine, coming out of Kazakhstan which is really bad even today they are confiscating books and burning books, Christian books and stuff in Kazakhstan at the moment, uh, persecuting the people who got them, you know, that sort of stuff's going on there. But he was saying there are a number of things that characterize what, um, how people respond to this sort of experience. A very important one is the response of your family. For example, a guy gets, you know, banged up, shoved in jail, he's tortured on a daily basis there for his faith in Christ. And if, if his wife is supportive and if the church gather around his wife and make sure that they get to eat and make sure they have what they need and the kids are taken care of, then that makes it all very, very different. Now you can understand that, can't you? And he describes some Chinese pastors, an 83-year-old guy who's been a Chinese pastor, Chinese church pastor all his life, been through all sorts of prisons and persecutions and so on. He's got nothing left, he's died all around him, except for the guys who've become Christians under his ministry and are now leading house churches themselves. And he describes meeting this guy, and now this guy thinks absolutely nothing of what he's been through. Because Christ is better. It's how you consider it. It's how you consider your experience in so many ways. So how should we think of it when hardships and hurts hit us? We look to a much longer future. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. The word that's used there is one word used, it doesn't say brothers and sisters, it says one, it says for people, you know, people who are both brothers and sisters, so we, in English we spell it out, if you're thinking, that doesn't sound like what I'm used to, that's what we do. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, think of it like this, think of it differently. We look to a much longer future, which means we think of things really very differently if we're Christian people. The big thing for the Christian is eternity, not Monday morning. Monday morning is the first step along the way, yeah? Sorry, you'll have to go to work, you know, it'll have to happen. It won't be necessarily a very good experience, it could be raining. Uh, you know, it might be, unpleasant. but actually, I am looking beyond that. There's a bigger thing going on here. So we're part of that. And the big issue to secure eternity is the faith that saves you. And you'll recognise a faith that saves somebody by the fact that they persevere in it to the end. So how should we think of the hardships we encounter for following Jesus? See, if you'd been chucked, as these people have that James is writing to, if you'd been chucked out of your house and your hometown, your employment, made into a refugee because you trusted Jesus, how would you relate to that issue? That wouldn't be easy. How happy would you be about it? Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Christian is called to live counterculturally in so many ways, with terribly dangerous influence, really. Um, we, you know, we come together in community on Sunday or in the week, or whatever we do, but then we're something to go out and be subversives <laughs> for the kingdom of God. Nothing malicious. Don't go, you know, getting the wrong idea, anybody, right? But that's the idea. And here's where the subversion begins: we think differently about things. What we forget about it all is that the key to living godly and countercultural lives lies here. It lies in thinking and considering in a different way, seeing things differently. It doesn't just lie in going out there, going out there, going for it, gritting your teeth, swimming against the flow. It lies in getting your head right. To decide how you actually view your life and your future, and to live in the light of that. So when you face trials, put aside the four knees. You're going to go for the opposite of that. When you face trials, 
Put aside stoically bearing with the hardships of it all, you're actually going to go for the opposite of that too. Put on a new attitude, says James, consider it joy because you know where it's getting eternally. You know this, this is taking you the big unfolding plan. Joy is what we meet trials with, is it? No. Not that. Pure joy. Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, both, whenever you face trials of a particular kind. No. Many kinds, multifarious trials, many kinds, not just the one. Compound problems and pressures. Have you noticed the way it doesn't come in ones? <laughs> Have you noticed that? Yeah. I meet the old ladies sometimes, and some of the old boys say, Comes in threes, and then two bad things have happened, and they say, Comes in threes. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> Would you like a cup of tea? You know? <laughs> Compound. Trials of many kinds. So pure joy, whenever you face trials of many kinds, consider it pure joy when things are pretty grim. Why? Why would you do that? If you can't answer that question, then what we've been saying so far is really pretty ludicrous. Ludicrous. You're mad. Why? Because, you know, the testing of your faith produces something. I'm hot. Are you hot? Mm -hmm. Say when you're cold. I'll live with that. <laughs> it's far too hot. You okay now? Is that right? Because you know the testing of your faith produces something. It is not futile. It's doing something. And it's doing something productive. The testing of your faith produces perseverance, maturity, completeness. See, the key to the difference about Christians is they really see things differently, consider things differently. And because you're not just living for the here and now, but for the future, you're thinking these current temporary afflictions, they are building for us something we look forward to. What Paul describes as an eternal weight of glory that far away is all. But it's fitting you for it. It's putting you in a place where you're going to get there for that. Does that make sense? It's building in you, in the things that are going to get you to the point where you need to be to benefit from eternity. Um, I said before me that Christian character is formed between the hammer and the anvil. It's not formed in Bible college. It's not necessarily formed in Bible study on Sunday mornings, but please keep coming. It's formed between the hammer and the anvil of our daily experience. As we find the resources of God, as we find God in all those things happening, and what it does, it builds a perseverance in you. And you're going to have to persevere. Why are you going to persevere? Because if you don't persevere in faith, you won't get the glory. Uh, that's a simple equation. We need to learn to persevere. <coughs> blessed, says James 1.12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. But to persevere. Hebrews 10, 36, you need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you'll receive what he's promised. The scripture's pretty clear. God does preserve his people. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. None can pluck them out of my hand. He preserves his people. How does he work out that? He preserves his people by having them persevere. He who is preserved is the one who perseveres. <clears throat> the proving of faith, the testing of faith, the trial of faith builds perseverance. It builds maturity. Mature Christians are the product of this testing. It's how you grow up. Now you see to some extent an illustration of this in, in what happens with, with your kids. Your kids sort of grow up and they've got to go away. Not that you want them to go away. You don't want them to go away. <laughs> yeah, okay. there comes a point. But, but uh, you know, the, the thing is, unless they, you know, it's painful when they leave. It's painful when they go. The nest seems ever so empty, you know, that noise and there's food in the fridge now and stuff like that. It's bizarre. They're gone. Unless they go and come back. They ain't gonna grow. They're not gonna come to maturity. They're not gonna have to face the sort of things that have brought us to a situation of maturity and stability and development of personality and character. They're gonna go. 
And it's as they go through things that those things go. As they have to deal with it. It's how you grow up. And thirdly, of course, completeness. The testing of your first faith produces perseverance and maturity and completeness. It leads to a perfection or a wholeness, a rounding of character. If you're coming back to God for the resources to deal with it. It is all too easy for these things to produce the opposite. Bitterness. Immaturity. Lack of responsibility. And that disease that gives up. James has got this perfection or maturation of Christians as a basic concern. He constantly stresses the need for a wholehearted, unreserved commitment to God and to do God's will. In fact, James, James highlights this as, as, a, as a foundational sin. This double-mindedness, that's a root of a lot of sin for James. Double-mindedness is, is a destroyer. We don't emphasize that enough. So here's a summary. What will we really benefit from as we persevere through suffering? The way we, we will consider it joy is to recollect that if we walk through it with God, then it will produce things in us that are of eternal benefit and significance. It's training. It's development. <coughs> so how do you ensure that you persevere in walking with God through your hardships? Here's the if. Here's how you handle hardship. Here's how you set about that. Such to benefit from it in this sort of way. How to handle hardships, verses 5 to 12. Here's the if. There is a very real possibility that Christians can waste the potential of their trials and difficulties. They're testing. If we don't secure these things through it. There's an assumption in all that James is saying, the Christian is going to live thoughtfully, thoughtfully about what's going on. Trying to perceive what it is that God seeks to achieve in us through our everyday experiences. So the first thing he speaks about as a component in our toolbox in handling hardship, the first thing he speaks about is seeking wisdom. Because all too often we seek sympathy. But the first thing we need is wisdom to deal with it. Well, sympathy's not bad, sympathy's great. But if it distracts you from what God is doing in you, with eternity in mind, then sympathy can become a pain in the neck, can't it? If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. There's the maturity issue. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded, unstable in all they do. The first thing you should do is you should ask for wisdom. What's going on here? Lord, I don't understand. I need wisdom to understand this. I don't get it. Now, let's be clear. This is not an intellectual, but a spiritual quality. I know a lot of people are intellectually very clever, but they don't need wisdom at all. And, and the opposite also applies. People are very, very wise, but O-levels? No. Oh, GCSEs? Sure, I'm my age. Well, they exactly. <laughs> So that's not what James has got in mind here. This wisdom is not prescribed, banned, written off for the non-academic or the dyslexic. Or on the basis of what James is saying here, the person with general learning difficulties, because it's God who gives it. And if you can ask, you can give. It is prescribed to the person who doesn't ask for it, who doesn't seek it in the circumstances of life. Ask God for it, because he gives it. You need wisdom? Ask God. You might not like what he gives you. <laughs> but it's going to be good for you. The second weapon in the Christian's army to deal with this, these times of general hardship is prayer. Prayer. The prayer that is the sort of vehicle of our relationship with God. How, how do we relate to him? We pray. We've got this thing about prayer, haven't we? Uh, uh, ooh, excuse me, the priest. Oh Lord, thou art a great. What are they going to English? Because it should be Welsh. Hang on. Oh Lord, thou art a great son of mighty God. Right? Where, where's that coming from? Oh Lord, thou knowest. Where's that coming from? You don't normally talk about that. You don't order your chips like that on a Friday night, do you? What's going on? No. 
prayer, biblically conceived, is that sharing of our hearts, our thoughts, our minds with God in a realistic way. For some people it's the reverence. There's reverence and there's mm. affectation. I don't know what affectation means. <laughs> well, you do because I just did it. Um, <laughs> it's when you're putting something on. Okay. Reverence is, is... We revered our fathers. We stood in awe of them, but we didn't speak to them in a funny voice. Because we would have had a clip around here wrong. Does that make sense? Reverence is one thing, and I hear people plead reverence for the sorts of things that I've just been knocking and I'm prepared to. Affectation. Stuff that isn't real with God in prayer. That's the sort of stuff you've got to get out of there, because that's not prayer. What is that? It's the pretending you've got to get rid of. So much of it. Now that's not to say that somebody may not, in the normal course of their life, speak like a 17th century Puritan, as they conceive it. Derek Nimmo. If you're Derek Nimmo, you're praying a Derek Nimmo voice. Yeah? Doesn't that make sense? But surely with the business we're about is to clear the rubbish that, that is around about God and religion and stuff. To get people back to the reality of a living relationship with the living God. As our Heavenly Father. Trouble? Pray realistically. One of the more realistic, encouraging things about <clears throat> The last month or so in the life of this church has been the way that um, there's been an increase in texting for prayer. When you pray about such and such. It's been great for me. I don't know about you. I find that really encouraging. Something's come up. I need your prayers, brother. Mm -hmm. Fine. Let's do that. That's great. Because James is saying, here's how to handle hardship. Seek wisdom. Get some prayer going. And we've seen today as we come together how God responds in that sort of prayer. Is that fair? Okay. What else has James got to say in verses 9 to 11? Verses, what, verse 5, seek wisdom. Verses 6 to 8, pray <coughs> Verses 9 to 11, stuff is not the answer. More stuff is not the answer. Now everybody needs to be properly resourced and all the rest of it. But we can get into a situation where we are crippled by what we think we do not have. We can be crippled by what we think we do not have. Stuff isn't the answer. That isn't the answer. I was chatting away to a returned missionary a few months, a few months ago now. Um, <clears throat> so I was dealing with his damp, uh, with my damp meter, trying to help the old boy out. And, uh, well, he's a returned missionary, you know, he's, he's spent his life in a closed Muslim country, and he's back there, and he's thinking, how does this guy manage it? But yeah, they're, they're, they're fine, they're absolutely fine. I said, well, how's the work? I said, well, that's great, we'd love to do this, we'd love to do that, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, but you're rich. I thought, I'm not. <laughs> Talking about it. You know, Struggling the pit, throwing things together to get projects to happen and stuff to happen and all the rest of it. Oh, we're rich, he says. Now, you do need stuff, and don't misunderstand what I am saying. You do need stuff in place to be able to get on the job and so on. Yes, you do. But stuff isn't the answer. That's what I'm trying to say. And persevering in fellowship and closeness to the God that James is talking about clearly is the answer. And he's saying that to people who've lost everything because they've had to go as refugees. And he's probably a person who knows the truth of what he's saying. It's a walk of faith, not of sight. And you've really got to persevere with it for that very, very reason. Because it's a walk of faith, not a walk of sight. That's not the answer, he says. Seek wisdom, pray is what's needed, stuff isn't necessarily the answer. And so now he's brought us to the key to persevering in salvation through suffering. It's been set out as living for eternity, drawing strength from your fellowship with God. And there's one big old pitfall, he now says. Here's the big message. Here's the big old pitfall. Here's the thing to watch out for. And days get hard. Here's the big old pitfall. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. If you start blaming the one who's your life and your strength for the temporary trials and troubles of your life, then you're not going to see it through, because he's the one who can help you through it. He's the one who's giving you the strength to do it. And if you start thinking like that, you'll cut yourself away from him, and you'll be down. 
That's the point that James has been leading us up to throughout this chapter so far. Here's the point. Don't say, I'm going to blame it on God. How, how many times have we seen that? We've seen people come to affliction and difficulty. It can be very real and very difficult and, and so on and so on. But there's that point. There's that point of decision being made. Which way am I going to go with this? Which way is it going to take me? Don't say this is God doing this. Don't say God's having a crack at me. God's put me on the bomb for that. The temptation is to attribute the evil of your experience to God. But when your circumstance is hard, well, you've got to decide that the outcome is going to be evil. Or whether it's going to take you to God is going to, going to bring you glory through it. It's a fiery experience. You blame it on God and you alienate the one who above all others can help you. And you mustn't do that, because if you do blame it on the God, then what you're getting at is the holiness of God. That's what you're detracting from. The very foundation characteristic of God is holiness of character. And that's bound to alienate you from the one who's, who's promised you the comforter, the spirit of truth, to be with you forever. Do you want to do it with him or without him? Against him? Would that be a good choice to make? The problem is we, we, we don't want responsibility. We? <laughs> we don't want responsibility at all for the things that we do, the things that we think we do. Um, the problem for many of us a lot of the time is one of facing our responsibility. Come, come back with me to a long, a long ago garden and a tale of a man and a woman and some apples. Adam, what have you been eating? Oh Lord. Oh Lord, he's got that voice on again. <laughs> oh Lord, the woman did give me and I did eat. Hang on, hang on. Who's responsible for this household? It's human nature, isn't it? No, says God. You did it. So many things humanly understandable, but actually quite wrong. In fact, eternally unhealthy. If we're going to say the least of it. It's your choice. You've got that option. But the rebellious response to the experience of hardship will have consequences that we will be responsible for. Because the responsibility of sinners is still theirs, even if we're suffering. Even if we have that thing that we can say in our defense, oh, but it was hard. Verse 15b makes that very clear. What's the cure that James holds out for all of this? Fighting back against God, blaming it on God, that big old pitfall. He says the cure for it is gratitude to God. Look at verses 16 to 18. There's the point. Who's got verses 16 to 18 for us? Anybody got it? Thanks, Sam. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is given above, given from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Thanks. So he's saying, listen, in all of this, consider this. Here's my partner in shock. He says, consider it. God's actually been very good to you. He's actually been very good to you. Uh, it's, it's rough, okay? The experience, we're not going deny the reality of how difficult things can get for people. No way. We, we see it, we do, we do it, we, we know that. But actually, he says, hang on. Let's keep it balanced here. God's actually been very good, and internally, steps in for you. So why are you going to let this temporary affliction drive a wedge between you and the one who is the source of everything that is good and eternal? It's very pure joy, my brothers, whenever you encounter trials of many kinds, because they're working out all this stuff for you, that are going to make sure that eternity is safe. And they're making you the man, they're making you the woman that is going to enjoy the presence of God for them. And even if they weren't, who have you got 